right. Uh, welcome everyone to today's webinar um, on controlling COVID-19 through indoor humidity management. I'm Graham Holmes and I'm here with Dr. Stephanie Taylor and Thomas Klein today. So thanks everyone for uh, joining us. Um, just as a bit of an agenda on how the next hour or so is going to go, uh, we'll start with Stephanie taking us through humidity and health and uh, why humidify your building for your occupants. Um, after that, we'll follow up with Tom looking at the Condair product line, a general overview of all of our products, uh, adiabatic versus isothermal, what those two terms mean um, and how they differ in technologies. Um, and then right at the end, uh, very quickly, I'm going to present our new uh, desiccant dehumidifier that we're launching. Um, and then we'll have a summary and a Q&A. So there is a question uh, area that is available for you guys to put in. Feel free to type questions throughout the presentation and I will be trying to answer them through tech, just typing as we go through. And if we don't get to that, we'll have a full Q&A at the end. Um, as for professional development hours, um, at the end of this, all attendees will receive a certificate from Condair that you can use to apply for your professional development hours for your area. Um, in addition, in the handout section, there is uh, today's slides, as well as Condair's uh, product, hand, uh, product handbook. Um, and there's one more thing I need to cover. Uh, at the end of this, we'll be sending out a follow-up email uh, with APA uh, outlining both the presentation, um, Condor handbook, product handbook, and uh, the answers to all the questions that we get. Sounds good. So now I'll turn it over to Stephanie to take it away on humidity and health. Good morning, everyone. Uh, so Graham, could I have the? Uh... I'll just work through the the slides as we as we go, if that works. Oh, wait, wait, I have different slides though. Oh, you got different slides. A little bit. <laughs> Can you just hand over the? Thing? Um. Yeah, I'll see how I can do that. One second. Sorry, I forgot to tell Graham. It's a living, breathing presentation. Okay, Stephanie, you are now presenter, so you should be able to show your slides. Great, thank you. So can you see that? Yep. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everybody, and happy May 4th. Um, and I'm very honored to be speaking with you. Uh, I know APA in Boston, I've worked with Sam Shepard, and he's awesome. So this morning, this is an exciting webinar because we're combining both the medical aspects and the health aspects of humidification with how to actually implement uh, these strategies in your building. And then you have your on-site, I mean, your local uh, expert. So to get started, controlling COVID-19 disease through managing your indoor uh, humidity. And again, I'm happy to be here with you via uh, this interface, this platform. So in the next half hour, uh, I will go through these areas. What this pandemic has actually done that we can view as a positive um, refocusing of, of our attention about how to manage buildings for health. Uh, some studies on human beings indoors. And then finally, uh, how do we actually manage our buildings to support uh, the occupants? So to get started, so I'm a physician and my journey to you, speaking up to you on this webinar actually began when I was still in medical school and I decided to have an adventure. So this is me in 1983. I look a little bit different, but I feel the same. But I went to Papua New Guinea for four months to do medical work. And you can see it was very rural. Uh, but even the hospital, the main hospital that I was based out of in Wewak, uh, was was as you see it. Family members would help take care of patients. 
The men's tuberculosis ward had a lot of open air ventilation, but the beds were close together. And the, you see the operating room there. That's me looking at the patient. And I have flip-flops on. The, the nurse didn't have gloves. We did have gloves, but we reused them. But you can see the hygienic conditions were not the same as in this country. And yet, in this uh, equatorial country, the patients went home after you know their treatment resolved. They didn't get new infections for the most part, despite these conditions. However, in our country, sorry if I can move my slide, in the US, going into our very modern hospitals um, is, is quite a risky proposition. Uh, it's being hospitalized is about the third leading cause of death in this country. And it's not from the reason you go into the hospital, it's, it's often it's from an infection that you get from the hospital. They say it's around 6% of patients get a uh, hospital-associated infection. It's actually probably higher than that, but these numbers are hard to uh, come by. So as a physician, I was very worried about that. You can see one of my pediatric oncology patients in the middle. She survived her cancer, survived her chemotherapy, and almost died from an infection. On the left, you see the, that's the dean of my son's medical school who had a ski injury, went to have his meniscus repaired, and not only lost his meniscus, but almost lost his leg, I mean his life, and he did lose his leg. So I was thinking, why is it in New Guinea, in this uh, country of the equator, a little north of Australia, did patients do so much better in terms of infections? And again, I thought back to medical school and to my mentor, uh, Dr. Folkman. Uh, he and I were doing uh, oncology research, cancer research, using mice. And one night around 11 o'clock or so, I realized that a lot of our mice were not doing well, controls and study mice. So I called Dr. Folkman and I said, I don't know what's going on, but something, something's amiss. So he came in at around midnight and we scrubbed the, the laboratory OR down top to bottom. And he said, never ever underestimate the power of the environment in clinical outcomes. So let's take a look at the environment. So as human beings, we, uh, we've really progressed in our ability to build buildings and to manage the indoor environment. We've gone from open shelters with a lot of communication with outdoor air, soil, uh, plants, animals. We, our shelters became more robust. We moved indoors by the Industrial Revolution. Most of our work uh, besides farming was indoors. And now in 2020, you know, we, we often work in these beautiful high-rise buildings with lots of windows that are sealed up. The air is filtered, recirculated. Um, it's very warm and comfortable. If your boss allowed it, you could take your shoes off at work and your feet wouldn't even get cold. However, along with the uh, advances in our building technology, despite uh, the very beneficial sanitation systems that we've developed, we're seeing a change in disease dynamics. So now in 2020, I don't have to tell anyone, you know, we're struggling with this coronavirus uh, outbreak. But we've, we've been witnessing a trend. As our buildings have become more enclosed and more tightly enclosed, we have less communication with the outdoor factors. We're seeing an increase in these uh, epidemics, pandemics, as well as allergies, autoimmune disorders. So we need to take a step back and say, are we doing something indoors that's contributing to these uh, alarming and actually now fairly crippling uh, epidemics and a pandemic in the case of COVID-19? So let's take a look at that question. Is our built environment contributing to disease trends? And if so, what can we do to reverse that? This isn't the first pandemic and it won't be the last. You can see back from the bubonic plague uh, in 1347, which was thought to be transmitted by rats. Some of the transmission was probably with rats, but there was a good component that was also pneumonic or airborne. The Spanish influenza was clearly airborne. And now here we are with COVID-19 in 2020, and we're being told to wear masks, of various types for various reasons. 
Um, so we've struggled with these dynamics before and we probably will again. So let's just take a look at COVID-19 uh, and this coronavirus. It's called the coronavirus because it has these little spikes that make the, uh, my, the virus at electron microscopic range kind of look like a crown in somebody's mind anyway. It's an RNA virus, meaning that RNA is the genetic material in the virus that allows it to replicate and to cause disease. RNA viruses are, are different from, for example, human genetic material. We use DNA as our primary replication material. RNA viruses make a lot of mistakes. It's like your teenager writing a paper and handing it in without any proofreading. So when this virus replicates, it just divides its RNA and there, it doesn't have the proofreading capabilities that animal cells have and other viruses. So consequently, anytime an RNA virus such as this coronavirus creates a mutation that can survive in an environment that was previously hostile, and if it finds a host such as us human beings that don't have any immunological memory and therefore we don't have any defenses, that virus can cause a pandemic. So again, let's come back to, are we doing something that is contributing both to the change in our immunity and to the environment in which this virus can, this newly mutated virus can uh, live? So just to take a closer look at human beings indoors, as I'm talking to you, Droplets are coming out of my mouth and nose, and as you're breathing, unless you're holding your breath, those droplets come out about 100 microns in diameter, and they carry all of the normal bacteria and viruses that are in your mouth and airways, and that's normal. We live with lots and lots of, of bacteria and viruses, and we need to. We wouldn't live without them. And you can see as this engineer works away, she's shedding skin flakes onto her surfaces, onto the surface of the table, those droplets coming out of her nose are normal. She's not dripping boogers, it's just normal breathing. And her GI tract is quite illuminated because we have lots of bacteria in our digestive system. And then depending on how the air is managed, how dry it is, how turbulent, there'll be more or less interaction between organisms on surfaces and organisms in the air. There's a very active exchange between the air and surfaces. I mean, we live in a three-dimensional world, not a 2D world. So it kind of makes sense. So, so this is remarkable. We now know that each of us human beings, uh, by cell number, we are only about 30% human. The other 70% of our cells are actually bacteria, bacterial and some viruses in there. So each of us is an ecosystem with clothes on. And as we go into a building, we shed our microbes. And depending on how a building is designed, used, and ventilated, certain organisms will persist in the indoor environment and certain ones won't, they'll just die off. So what this means is that buildings are now the evolutionary natural selection force for the microbes that are going to persist around human beings because we spend about 90% of our time indoors. So not only does the indoor environment affect our health, it affects which organisms are gonna persist and stay infectious, uh, which good organisms will remain in our environment. So it's really critical that we look at the indoor environment from the perspective of health. So this is a study from, uh, started in 2014 to look to ask the question, how does the management and the design and the use of the building contribute to microbial communities indoors and then ultimately to uh, occupant health? And this study was done in a hospital, which is very convenient because we had a lot of data on the occupants or the patients. So this group, uh, collected data for over a year in a brand new hospital. It was Leeds Silver in the Chicago area. All the rooms were single rooms with vestibules with private baths. And they collected all of this, uh, the, 
the indoor parameters that you see listed there. So temperature, hand hygiene protocols, and compliance, room pressurization, lighting, CO2, humidity, traffic, room air changes, and outdoor air. And so they were looking at those parameters as they related to microbial communities. So I found out about this study and said, hey, could, could I look at patient outcomes in those areas that we studied to see if there's a relationship between the building and new infections? So we had a lot of data to analyze. We sent it off to our statistician and said, are any of these indoor parameters independent variables uh, relating to infections? So just think about that for a second. So it ended up, they came back with the uh, data analysis and said, well, when the relative humidity in the patient rooms is low, low meaning 30, 32%, the infection rate is high. And as the average relative humidity in the patient rooms, not in the supply duct, but in the rooms, goes up over 40%, the infection rate came way, way down. But you can see it's also a seasonal trend. So I, I didn't believe it. We, we fired that statistician, got a new one who said, no, this is an independent variable. Dry air correlates with more infections. I was still skeptical. So this is another study that's now six years in the running in a uh, nursing home. And these folks also suffer with uh, dementia like Alzheimer's or other sources. So we collected uh, indoor uh, parameters and then, again, looked at whether or not those related to uh, patient infections. So after four years, when we had no humidification intervention, we found this trend. So on the x-axis, you have relative humidity. On the y-axis, you have the number of infections. The orange line is our respiratory infections, bacterial and viral, and the blue line are GI infections. And you can clearly see that when the relative humidity is low, that the infection rate is high. And as you reach 40% indoor relative humidity, not outdoor, but indoor, between 40 and 60%, we have this sweet spot where you have the fewest number of infections. And it was particularly obvious with respiratory and GI. We didn't see it with urinary tract infections. Those tend to be uh, more determined by whether or not someone's in a wheelchair and their, their bowel continence and stuff like that. But with the other infections, as the relative humidity approached 40%, they, you had a very low rate. So those are great uh, correlation studies. This is a study done by the Mayo Clinic where they took a preschool. You just think about when your child goes off to preschool and then comes home and everyone starts getting sick. So in this school, which is northern Minnesota, they took half of the school and humidified it to 45%. And the other half of the building, the other half of the school did what a building in Minnesota does in the wintertime. The relative humidity goes very low. So they looked at, they were focusing on influenza A, and what they found was in the humidified part of the building, you had uh, less than half the number of infectious airborne particles compared to the non-humidified part of the school. Not only that, but with influenza A, the actual infectivity or the virulence of the virus was diminished uh, by over half in the humidified part of the school. So you had fewer infectious particles. The ones you did have were less infectious. So that's a separate effect. And ultimately you had, as you can see, uh, almost 66% uh, reduction in the number of sick kids in the humidified part. So let's just quickly, in the little bit of time left here, let's think about what indoor air factors are gonna determine whether or not this grows cough so say this person has COVID-19 and they didn't have a mask on. This person comes into your office or home and coughs. What air parameters are going to determine whether or not you or your family is going to get sick? So I just want to put this out there. Yes, this uh, virus 
uh, is being found to spread further than the one to two meters, three to six feet. So there's the CDC and the World Health Organization uh, is reluctant to be clear about this, but uh, we are finding viral RNA um, up to 20, 25 feet away. People are getting sick who had no direct contact. So uh, this virus is spread through long distance fine aerosols. This is just one study in an ICU. You can see the patient bed and viral RNA was, was recovered um, in this study up to 14 feet away. So let's just accept the fact that we do need to manage indoor air transmission of this uh, disease. So if you think about the disease steps, the transmission steps, you have really three columns. You have the person who comes in and coughs or sneezes or releases the virus in their uh, droplets, large and small droplets. We can't control that by the building. You know, maybe they can put a mask on or you can lock the door, keep them out. But the building per se can't really protect you from how much a person coughs. But it can affect the middle column. It can affect not only how many particles are in the air, it can affect how big the particles are. And therefore, if they shrink, which they do in low relative humidity, they desiccate, become droplet nuclei and can spread far. And furthermore, as we talked about with influenza A, many viruses and bacteria are more infectious when they're in that uh, low humidity environment. And we're still trying to figure out exactly how that works with COVID-19, but we do know that the number of particles in the air is less with any uh, respiratory um, pathogen. And thirdly, and this is really interesting, other people, the rest of you, the rest of your family, everybody in a building has a healthier immune system when the relative humidity is somewhere around 50%, 40 to 60. So when you have dry air, you're gonna have greater aerosol transmission. It's harder to clean surfaces because you have recontamination from airborne particles. And with many organisms, the survival and the, the infectivity is high when the air when the air is dry. So for example, as you saw in that video, things come out, droplets come out of your mouth, about 100 microns in diameter, at 20% relative humidity, humidity, they rapidly desiccate to reach a moisture equilibrium with the air, and they they very quickly become what are known as droplet nuclei, these little 0.5 micron particles that we used to think were dead. We now have different uh, analysis tools. We now know that the infectious organisms in those teeny, teeny, tiny droplet nuclei, not only are they not dead, they're actually highly infectious. And they can float through your building out the window um, and are found actually days later with some organisms. And this is that this is the other uh, component that indoor air, um, the other impact it has on viruses directly. So this is influenza A, and you can see, this is in live guinea pig, on the x-axis when the relative humidity is between zero and up towards 40%, the infectivity is high, but something happens at 40% relative humidity, and the infect infectivity or the the viability plummets. And with many organisms, it comes back up again at 60% relative humidity. So for some reason, 40 to 60% uh, is like this sweet spot for relative humidity where pathogens, the bad microbes, are less bad. And this is looking at the coronavirus, looking at um, inactivation. And the black line at the top is 20% uh, relative humidity and 20 degrees centigrade. So probably what we keep our buildings at. And you can see that the infectivity uh, continues. It lasts a long time. At 80% relative humidity over the sweet spot, upper limit, you can see that those viruses are inactivated more quickly. But they're inactivated the most quickly when the relative humidity is at 50%. So this is a, a really fascinating 
uh, and we don't fully understand what happens in droplets in this humidity that, that correlates with the inactivity of many pathogens. And then that third column, what happens to people? So us human beings, we were not designed to live in low water vapor states. It affect, affects our brain, our respiratory tract, our eyes, and our skin. And in fact, somebody my size, for example, I'm, I don't know, 50 kilogram woman or however much I weigh, I have about half of a tennis court, including the double lines, the double alleys, um, in surface area, if you go all the way down into my lungs, that is available for losing moisture when I breathe. So not only skin uh, moisture losses count, but also the moisture you lose through breathing. And when you're in a dry room, um, unless you have an IV running, you're going to be one to one and a half percent dehydrated in eight hours. You get tired, you might get a little depressed or anxious, it affects our respiratory system, our eyes, and our skin. So this was, this group, uh, there was a group at Yale, Dr. Uh, Akiko Awasaki, who did this amazing research, was published in May of last year, 2019. And they used genetically engineered mice because they needed to take the lungs out and chop them up and look at them. So they couldn't do that to people. So they used genetically engineered mice that had the same re immune response, uh, in this case to influenza, as human beings do. And the question was, why do we get the flu in the winter? And we now know it's because of low indoor relative humidity. So they were wondering why, what mechanisms in your body contribute to that? And it ends up that there are several critical stages of your immune system and in this case, we'll talk about your respiratory immune system that is actually impaired or harmed by dry air. So your, the mucus in your throat becomes uh, dehydrated and more viscous when you're inhaling dry air. And once that viscosity increases by only 6%, those little hairs called cilia that are constantly waving upwards to protect your lungs so the particles can't settle in your lungs, the cilia cannot work very well when that mucus is viscous. Same if you smoke cigarettes, you temporarily paralyze the cilia um, from the nicotine. It's temporary uh, if you're a smoker, but so when that mucus is thick, the cilia can't work. And we now know that furthermore, the, the very first steps of your immune system are uh, impaired. You can't, the cells that would normally Repair and inflammation don't work. We don't produce interferon, which is a protective protein. So it's not just that your airways get somewhat dry and uncomfortable. You're actually harming your ability to fight any infection that you might uh, come in contact with. We have known for quite a while that this sweet spot exists. This is the uh, Avondel Sterling chart from 1985, showing that bacterial infections, viral, respiratory in general, allergies and ozone problems are the least problematic when the relative humidity is 40 to 60 percent. But we now know, furthermore, with these new uh, genetic analysis tools, that this sweet spot where pathogens or the bad microbes, the bad microbes are less bad between 40 and 60 percent, and human beings were healthier, were more productive, we sleep better, we learn better, um, so the data is continuing to support this, uh, this interval. So let's go back and think about buildings. I mean, we want to have protective structures. We want to be energy efficient. That's important for uh, financial purposes, for climate change, for the ozone, greenhouse gas effect. But we really, we really have to think about occupant health. And if, if anything good comes from this pandemic, it has fast forwarded our focus on the fact that buildings exist to protect people. And we really need to prioritize human health indoors um, and not just think about buildings as beautiful things on the landscape to buy and sell and make money from. We need to think beyond energy efficiency and look at human health. And if all of these three steps of disease transmission 
Keeping your indoor humidity between 40 and 60% is the only strategy that I know of that not only takes care of viral transmission in the airborne environment, but actually, in addition, supports the immune system of occupants. And there are other strategies to address the middle part, you know, filtration, UVC, some very beneficial um, implementation. But only relative humidity in this zone will also protect the secondary, uh, potential secondary hosts. So it's incredibly effective and it's holistic in the sense that we're not creating increased virulence, we're not creating another superbug down the road. So I think uh, I need to wind this up. So what we've talked about is that relative humidity indoors, maintained between 40 and 60%, decreases the burden of COVID-19 virus in the air. Um, it decreases the number of aerosols. It actually optimizes the things we're already doing, such as social distancing. It helps with our hand washing uh, benefits because you don't have your hands being recontaminated from airborne uh, particles. Um, and we think it actually works like other viruses where the infectivity is lowered by that uh, range of relative humidity. And as we've talked about, humidification in this zone um, also supports our own respiratory uh, immune system. So I believe that Mother Nature gave us this opportunity of indoor 40 to 60%. You, know, you bring outdoor air in with whatever absolute humidity it has, and when you warm it up without adding humidity, you, we lose that beneficial sweet spot. And so as time has gone on and we've sealed our buildings, we warm them up to be comfortable, we don't have skin sensors for humidity, so we've lost sight of the fact that uh, human beings need to live with water vapor, and we now live indoors. So we need to manage our indoor environment uh, to, to support our health. So thank you. And now I'm going to turn it over to, uh, to Graham. Graham. Yep, thanks, Stephanie. Um, yeah. So incredibly important information. Um, and yeah, definitely remembering those two last facts is very, very important. Um, Tom, uh, I got the slides up for you here. So feel free to jump back on and we can start going through how we can accomplish uh, getting our humidity levels to 40 to 60%. Great, thanks, Graham. Uh, just as you see on your screen, just a couple of quick reminders. Uh, there's two different ways we can add humidity to a building. Isothermal being what is traditionally thought of as humidification, meaning I take electricity and I boil water in one of two ways, or I burn natural gas. Um, I could do it on somebody's roof or inside their building in a, in a mechanical room, or I tap off of somebody's boiler, or in uh, certain cases, maybe there's a central uh, steam line underneath the the road that we can tap into as an energy source. So that's isothermal. It's a single source thermal or adding energy to that tank or to that water supply to get it to turn into steam. The other way that we can humidify is adiabatic. And what we do simply there is we're introducing a, a raw droplet of water into a system, whether it be directly into a room. Let's say you had a, a printing facility with a lot of equipment running or um, uh, Quest as a, a diagnostic diagnostic testing facility. They have a whole bunch of robots sitting in a gigantic laboratory environment. All of that heat's generated in the room, and sometimes, if if the customer will allow it, it really can work. As we can spray raw water without mineral in it, so there's no dust in that space. So clean water that we could drink. That's really what we say here is that if I can drink it and be comfortable drinking it, then I should be able to humidify with it. And that's really part of this hygiene aspect as well. But in that case at Quest, if we were able to spray water right in their atmosphere around the perimeter of that room, we're getting them two things they need. A, they need humidity, and B, they can use the cooling because there's a lot of activity going, a lot of mechanical work. 
We can also take advantage of this system in, in an air handler. We, there's many different ways and we have all the technologies as you'll see here in a second that we can introduce raw water inside an air handler or a duct and pass relatively warmer, drier air through this section and evaporate that water and humidify. And, and sometimes, especially like an economizer season, give you cooling that you'd like to have anyway. So next slide, Graham. So just, I'm not gonna cover everything. I just wanna show you, we have two different ga uh, electric units, a, a natural gas fired, and a couple of different live steam units. One is directly into somebody's boiler that, hey, um, I know a lot of hospitals in Boston do this, they'll tap right into their boiler and inject that air or that steam right into their airstream. It's effective, it's cost effective, just have to worry about the, the quality of the water sometimes. Remember we talked back about, you know, if, you, if I'm comfortable drinking it, there's no problem humidifying with it. Sometimes with boiler water, we have to kind of talk to the customer or, or the owner and say, maybe we will want to go to something like a steam to steam exchange and we, we have that as well. Uh, all of these units you see can be put in a room or we can have them on a roof on an outdoor atmosphere. Next slide, Graham. Here's our lineup, and uh, what I'll say at this point about Condair, and you, know, you work with APA for their expertise, hopefully you're working with Condair for our expertise, there is not a system in the world that we don't have for humidification or evaporative cooling. So we're a one-stop shop. We're not here to push a specific technology on you, but because we have all these technologies, we can meet all these needs that you might have. A need for one customer is gonna be different than a need for another, but we have all the solutions that are that are needed. So on the left three, those are all in duct um, or in the air handler, typically in the air handler solutions, uh, ranging from wetted evaporative media, something like you can find at a data center for cooling, but it can be used um, for, you know, if you had a bank downtown that wanted to humidify and they really didn't have a lot of space in the air handler and they were comfortable with wetted media, we could do that. Uh, uh, high pressure nozzle system, Great, it's nice if you're doing multiple air handlers, we can use one skid for multiple air handlers. The downside is with a high pressure system, and it's not just us, it's anybody because of the physics, I'm gonna need six to eight feet of air handler space. And then last but not least, we have a hybrid, which kind of takes the best of both. I have the instant on, instant off of sprayed water, but I also spray this water against a permanent ceramic media. If you're dealing in the hospital or medical environment, the high pressure system and the DL or the, the hybrid are both acceptable there. I would not use a wetted media and it's really not accepted. And then on the right hand side, there's all sorts of different products we can use in a space. Uh, we've used products like this inside of laboratories, inside of universities, inside of uh, printing facilities and, and uh, industrial sites. So uh, lots of different ways that we can introduce a raw droplet of water into a space and get it to evaporate and humidify. And last but not least down at the bottom, if the customer does not have technical water available, if they don't have reverse osmosis water available that we would need for this because of the dust requirement, we can provide the water if they can't. So Graham, next slide. Just, I'm not gonna do a ton of covering on this. APA, I'm sure you're familiar with these. APA is the expert in humidification in, in the New England market. They know this like the back of their hand. This is our economical electrode bottle. It's a plastic canister. Most people are familiar with it. I call it, I affectionately call it our water microwave. Uh, basically, we're not heating the water through a heating element, water heater. It's really, uh, energizing the molecules at 60 times per second or 60 hertz, creating friction in the water, getting the friction to cause enough heat to make the water boil. I can't overheat it, I can't over amp it, and it's the most uh, cost efficient, first cost unit in the market. Next one, Greg. Next up. Another different electric unit, if you need tighter control, if you have a laboratory, you want it plus or minus one or 2% control or 100% fresh air unit, or you wanna boil reverse osmosis water because you don't want scale in it. We're gonna bring you here, which is our, our heating element style. So think now electric water heater. 
the cool thing about this product is, is if you're using potable water or softened water that might have scale in it, that blue tank in the bottom hand of the unit is a unique to Condair, formerly known as Nortec, still has the Nortec name on the, um, the cabinet. We haven't changed. Uh, that is a scale management system. As you boil water, as you create scale by boiling that water, all that scale just kind of settles into that tank and all it takes for the owner to do is empty the tank, uh, one screwdriver, the collar removes, you can shake the scale out and replace the tank. Go ahead, Graham. Next up, gas-fired units. Very popular in, in New England because of the cost of gas versus the cost of electric. Um, again, we can get you a rooftop unit. Uh, the indoor units are available in two styles, well, three actually, a low NOx, a condensing high efficient, and a medium uh, efficiency. Uh, Outdoor units at this point still are medium efficiency. We're working on that to bring that to market. But we any sort of indoor application you've got, we can do high efficiency, uh, which is better efficiency than the low NOx. We actually have to detune these units a little bit for California and low NOx environment. So if you don't have that requirement, we're going to just take you all the way to the high efficient model. Next one, Graham. I kind of alluded to this already. You can just see that right on the screen. On the left-hand side, you've got an evaporative media unit, um, compact, easy to retrofit. I can just use potable water. The downside though is I will have to replace that media between three and five years down the road. A uh, big fiberglass block of media. And then depending on the size of the air handler we put this in, you can have three, four, five, six, seven zones of, of media. So you can understand that our control may not be as tight as something like an instant on, instant off humidifier, which is the two on your uh, screen there, the high pressure and the hybrid. Uh, we talked about that before, the high pressure, instant on, instant off, can be very cost effective if we can divide it amongst up to four air handlers for cost. Downside though is, um, it is a high pressure system, so the wear on the nozzles is a little bit more. Um, and I'm going to need six to eight feet of air handler space to make this efficient. Why? We spent a lot of money making RO water. We don't want to have that RO water not evaporate in the section and go down the drain. So that's why we're pretty much it's physics, no matter what manufacturer, but we'll be right up front with this, six to eight feet. And last but not least, our hybrid. Um, very popular um, because we're taking that RO water at a much lower pressure, and we're spraying it against the permanent ceramic media. It also has silver ions in the water. It's the only unit on the globe that have a, has a hygiene certificate from an accredited hygiene lab. So we can provide that for you. So you're, you can be comfortable with it, and your owner can be comfortable with it. Next slide, Graham. Just an example, this would be our hybrid or DL product. You can see the water comes in, we take it through a filter, uh, backflow prevention, uh, put it through a softener and a carbon tank, and that's really to protect your RO membranes. Then we pass it through RO system, so we take out all the minerals through reverse osmosis, squeeze it all out, and then we can pass it through a hydraulic controller and get three, four, five, uh, zones of control, meaning at five banks of control, I can get you plus or minus three quarter percent humidity control. Um, I want to just say one thing here about evaporative humidification. If you have a building that's using economizer and you can do enthalpy control, it's uh, evaporative humidification is the only technology out there that you actually can save energy throughout the year, meaning the energy you have to put in in the water to humidify is more than offset by the extent economizer will do. Typically, customers are seeing between 20 and 40 extra days a year of being able to run economizer with LP control. And that's how, why we can humidify a whole building actually for less energy cost. And I know that's important, um, especially in uh, Boston and that area, but it becomes more and more important. So we can actually accomplish both. We can give your owner humidity that they want if they're using economizer and save them energy at the same time. Next slide, Graham. Just a quick view, this would be an in-space. I mentioned it earlier. Uh, we use this at some quests uh, in, the, in the Midwest. 
Quest Diagnostics has been able to implement uh, pressurized water space to cool and humidify directly in their uh, basically manufacturing environment. Keurig up north of uh, Boston doing the coffee pods. I enjoy a couple every morning. Uh, humidify all their plants with the same sort of system can be implemented in uh, in that way. Go ahead, Graham. I want to show you just kind of energy costs. And um, the two gigantic bars there on the right side of your screen are electric bottles. So you can see this is a uh, uh, example. Salt Lake City, a little bit drier, but we really similar kind of cost comparisons. Uh, the next one down will be live steam. We tap off somebody's boiler. The next one lower would be steam to steam exchange. We're still using that low cost energy source, but we have to add a little bit of electricity, but we get a clean humidity if they're not if you're worried about your boiler. And then finally, GS and then media evaporative and then high pressure and the uh, DL and in space. So the closer we can get to that evaporation, the more money we can save. And that's that's part of the, the trade-off here. So, Graham, next slide. Now I'll turn it over to Graham. He's talking about something new for us. Thanks, Tom. Um, I just want to point out quickly on the last slide, um, Condair is available to make this exact graph for your application that you have for your building. So if you're interested in looking into getting a humidification technology and set up for you, reach out to APA um, and they'll be able to generate this for you through us. Okay, thanks guys. Um, for the new product, so I'm gonna run through this extremely quickly. Um, Condair is now becoming a complete humidity control company. So for a long time, we've been the experts in humidification. Now we're get, jumping on the other side of the equation. So with our push for 40 to 60% control, there's 60 to 100 that needs to be handled too. And this is where our new desiccant dehumidifier, the DA series, comes in. So brief introduction on dehumidifiers. There's two types of dehumidifiers. The first one is a condensing dehumidifier. This is one you typically use for your basement during the summer or for indoor swimming pools, where you have a cooling coil that you pass the air across. That cooling coil makes that air reach dew point and has that water in the air condense. You then collect that water and drain it, or in the case of a small portable one, have to pick up that bucket and dump it down the drain yourself. Then it warms the air back up again and sends it off into the space. A desiccant dehumidifier, which is the type we're using, works with two different air streams and a large desiccant wheel in the center. That desiccant wheel in the center is made of fiberglass impregnated with silica gel. Silica gel, you might know from those small packets that you get in shipping pa packages. Uh, they basically absorb moisture from the air very well. And if you heat them up, we'll actually expel that moisture back to the air. So the way we use that is with the two different airstreams. So you'll have a process airstream passing through the desiccant wheel. It dries the air, actually gets a bit of a heat gain from it as well, from an adiabatic process. So the opposite of our adiabatic humidifiers. So the opposite process heats that air up a little bit. And then that wheel is now gonna be full of moisture. And as it turns into the regeneration area, area that's, a sec that's the secondary air stream where you pass air uh, through some sort of heating technology. In our case, we're using electric heaters. Um, that hot air now has more capacity for moisture and will take the moisture from the wheel and then that air stream you exhaust. So now you've regenerated that wheel, it spins back into the process air and repeats the process to continually dry the air you're passing through. Um, where those two technologies are more effective, condensing dehumidifiers are effective in very humid areas. Um, so hot and humid areas for the most, point, most part. And desiccant dryers are better as it gets colder and drier. And in eventually for condensing dehumidifiers can't even be used in applications that 
desiccant dryers can. Of course, there's a crossover section between the two, but I generally like to point out that the crossover is usually about 72 Fahrenheit, 50% RH. And anything below that, desiccant's better. Anything above that, you might be able to do with the uh, condensing unit instead. Uh, the last thing I'm going to point out, and there's many slides to go th here, through here with um, loads of information that I welcome you to go through afterwards on your own. And if you have any questions, reach out to me. But I'd just like to show off the seven unit capacities that we're launching with. So CFM wise, which is how you generally rate desiccant dehumidifiers, we're working between about 300 CFM up to 2354 CFM. Uh, voltages, either 208 or 483 phase. And the pounds per hour, uh, which is benchmarked at 72 Fahrenheit and 60% relative humidity, range from seven pounds per hour of moisture removal up to 44 pounds per hour moisture removal. Uh, most importantly from all of this, it's all the same footprint of unit. And our biggest um, benchmark or uh, feature spec stopper is that the entire unit is UL certified. So there's no problem bringing it into your building and having it installed. So a couple of pictures of the unit itself. Um, and then there's many different typical installations that we can look through. Um, but that's it for me. Um, thanks everyone for joining us. Uh, we'll now start the Q&A. Um, so we do have a question here from Wayne. Um, and Tom, I think this is prioritized towards you. So is there an increased potential for microbial growth in systems? And are you aware of added cleaning or sterilization costs to owners? Well, on, uh, on isothermal, it's usually not a problem. I believe that's, so isothermal, not a problem. We're boiling water. It's got programmable systems inside these units that will drain its water if there's no call for humidity. On the wetted water, and I think that's probably more what you're talking about, is as long as we, so two parts. A, something like the DL or hybrid, it's got, a hygiene certificate where we're being very cautious about the water so it's water passes through a uv light first before we introduce into that system secondly we're passing it or we're introducing a small amount of silver ion to that so in that case there's absolutely no chance of microbial growth or you know, or anything that you're going to be worried about so the cost is typically a silver canister that lasts year and a half to two years typically um, so that's just part of the system and we would show that to you we're upfront about that as to what it's cost and what when it needs to be taken care of the other cost about uh, a system like that would be the RO water um, you know it's no different than softening it but there are RO water skids and stations that need to be taken care of that way but microbial wise uh, some of the worst problems I've seen, it hasn't been with us, but I've seen these systems before, is somebody designing a, a cabinet that's not stainless steel and not drained properly. So in other words, not following proper slopes of drains, creating pockets where water can sit. That's the biggest problem in a system like that is water sitting there. Uh, nobody likes that. Nobody wants that water to stagnant by putting it in a pocket. Uh, for something like the wetted media that we use off all the data center, um, the units will will periodically dry themselves. We're also putting you late in the tank and conductivity sensor to measure the the dirtiness of the water and pump it out, put fresh back in. So those things can be mitigated, um, especially with something like a DL that has a hygiene certificate. No problem using it in a hospital environment and not introducing further problems. Thanks, Tom. Um, in the same vein, um, I guess we'll bring up the, the M word here. So uh, mold, um, and Stephanie, I'll let you kind of jump into this. Um, so if we're, if we're recommending 40 to 60% relative humidity, do we need to be concerned about mold in the building? 
Oh, that's a great question. I'm glad that uh, somebody asked that because it's in the back of people's minds. So it ends up that uh, the military did studies on indoor or on humidity and mold growth. And unless you're up around 85% to 90% relative humidity, mold is not hygroscopic. So mold can't grab water vapor or water in the vapor form out of the air and bring it into its organism for growth. Mold needs liquid water. So if you're thinking, well, it's kind of the same thing. If you have a cold pipe and it comes into contact with 50% uh, 70 degree humidified air, you're going to get condensation. And that's true. Liquid water from condensation is a problem, whether it's in the interstitial space of your wall or under a pipe. The solution is not to lower the relative humidity so that you're living in the Sahara Desert. The solution is to create proper building uh, envelopes and, and uh, insulate your cold spots so that you don't reach that 0.8 water activity of dew point within an interstitial space. So mold needs liquid water. So you, you don't want that hanging around in your building. If, heaven forbid, you do have mold, and actually most of us have mold in our homes to some degree, the worst thing you can do is just go down to your basement, see or smell mold, and just stick a dehumidifier in. Because then you're going to break up the mold, and it's going to release the hyphae and the spores into the air, and that's when you're going to become truly symptomatic. So mold and humidification. You cannot grow mold on water vapor. You need liquid water. So do what it takes to prevent that. Number two, or yeah, two, if you have mold, remediate the mold, get rid of it, and but continue to maintain your humidity in that healthy zone. So I hope that answers that question. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, we got one here from Jason. Um, so Stephanie, in the studies you've performed, uh, did the buildings experience any challenges with winter condensation buildup? We have seen brand new buildings wrestle with this issue at 30% relative humidity. So a bit in line with what you had just said. Yeah, so that's a great question again, Jason. Uh, so in the nursing home uh, where we I showed you the first part of the study, the first four-year part, we uh, have now humidified actually with Condair uh, units. Uh, they're maintaining that in that 40 to 60% sweet spot. And they have found in the older part of the building, in a couple patient rooms, they were getting condensation uh, on the windows. So what they did in those rooms was, uh, number one, at times when it's very cold outdoors, they would lower the relative humidity to like 35%. But the other thing that they did, which I think is going to become more common practice, they move their more vulnerable uh, patients away from those uh, areas where condensation was occurring. So yes, yeah, sometimes um, if you don't have uh, you know good R value windows or you have any sort of thermal bridge, you know you can see condensation. Um, but it's not a reason to just a priori crank the humidity down to 20% or turn your humidifier off. It needs to be managed. In certain cases, like a large building, we've seen owners uh, implement something like an air curtain on the front of the windows to lower a different temperature of, of air to the windows area. So if you had a, a commercial building and an atrium, it had condensing happening. Uh, it can be worked around through design. Now, it does take planning, but it can be worked around. We've seen that before. Thanks, guys. Um, Tom, this one's directed at you uh, from Tom as well. Um, is there an air handler? Uh, where in an air handler would you typically add a humidification section? After the coils and fans, before, post filter, what's the ideal choice? Okay, that's one of those engineering questions. Is there a perfect place? I wouldn't say there's an absolute perfect place. Where we like to see them and where it typically ends up being is between heating coil and cooling coil. Now, we do have customers who say, hey, want this humidification after final filter. Um, we do those spots as well. So 
you tell us where you're more comfortable, where your customer wants them, and we can work in that spot. 80% of the time, I'm seeing them between heating coil and cooling coil. Probably the other 20% of the time, I do see them after final filter. Because people are worried about if we're going to run a little bit higher relative humidity and I'm going to run half a filter, I don't want them to get moist. I don't want them to, to have a problem and clog up primarily from excess moisture. Uh, but when we run, you know, if we're using ice, some of them will talk about absorption and making sure we've got you know, smoke detectors and all that sort of stuff out of that region. Um, if we're talking about evaporation, we're going to talk about control and then we'll implement what the solution that we've talked about. Okay, thanks, Tom. Also, for an added benefit uh, with it between heating and cooling coil, if there is a vast air temperature change in that air handler and you start hitting dew point, it'll be collected in that cooling coil drain pan, correct? Correct. That's that's where most people like to see it because there is a little bit more give and take in that area between heating coil and cooling coil. Um, your Anna air handler um, evaporation wise, we're going to specify with you and with your air handler manufacturer. We want a st all stainless section with proper drains, one or two drains and proper access. Uh, it does create a natural place that whether we're going isothermal with steam or evaporation, it creates a natural place that we kind of contain it in that area. Okay, uh, next question here from Jason. Um, what's the pressure drop of the ceramic hybrid unit? And is this factored into the energy savings we reported? So I'll just quickly say yes, it's in the energy savings report that we have, um, and then pass it off to you, Tom. Typically at 450 feet a minute or so, and that's typical air handler speed these days, about a, a two inch or so of water column works in this. Surprisingly open, if you got to see a piece of it, um, uh, I do have a piece. I don't know if you can see that, I'll hold it up to the camera a little bit. You can kind of see me through the background of it. It's it's a, almost like a piece of coral. That's a really thin piece that we use. This is an actual chunk of it we're using um very open uh ceramic so really doesn't absorb in there but it just creates that surface area that we need to get all that water to evaporate but very low pressure drop and the, if you in today's environment we're usually you know on occupied building we're gonna a vav or uh, use a drive to slow the air handler down believe it or not the slower we go the more efficient this becomes because i it's a factor of uh, air dwell time and the thickness of your media. This is not a real thickness. It's usually a bit, probably almost double that thickness, but I actually go up in water usage as my airspeed goes down. Hopefully that helps. Thanks, Tom. Um, Stephanie, question to you from Wayne. Uh, since droplet size is larger with humidity, it should be easier to filter the air. Any recommend, uh, recommended filtration level for COVID-19 droplets? You know, Wayne, that's a great question. And um, I don't have data on that. So as you are asking, how do you manage the droplets? So of course the droplets will be somewhat bigger uh, in uh, that 40 to 60% zone rather than say 20%. But I'm not a filter expert, I have to tell you. Um, so I think I'm the wrong person to ask that, unfortunately. Um, yeah, we do know that the droplet size won't shrink nearly as much. So, you know, perhaps there's, I don't want to say you'll need less filtration, but uh, for a filtration expert, they'll be dealing with a, um, a larger droplet. Um, Tom just, uh, Tom Choice, not Tom Klein, just noted that ASHRAE recommends a filter rating of MERV 13 or higher for buildings yeah. and for, for this exact scenario. My, my, I'm on the ASHRAE Epidemic Task Group and we the, the filter ratings that are recommended um, don't specify uh, any indoor humidity level. So I think your question, Wayne, is uh, you're, you're ahead of the curve in people's thinking which is awesome. Yeah. Okay, uh, question with 
adiabatic evaporator humidification is there typically an associated temperature drop uh, which occurs during winter operation? Are you suggesting heat prior to humidification, after or both? How is the loop trimmed in the control sequence? So that's, we're talking about enthalpy control is, is the control method. But yes, you, you have a natural drop in humidity or temperature. So in the winter time, we're gonna plan on overheating the air. And we have a, when we design one of these, you know exactly how much extra overheat you would need. And you know, the control of that is be your BMS. Uh, we're looking at relative humidity for a set point. We're looking at enthalpy control for comfort level. And then your BMS is going to fine tune the heat at the same time the humidifier is going to fine tune its output. And so less output, less heat we need. Um, they will um, naturally kind of work with each other. Uh, but we're always going to give you a design that's coming off it. Typically, uh, most designs are saying, hey, I want, I want to come off the evaporator at 55 degrees. So maybe we'll have to go into that section at 75 degrees. But you're going to know that in design phase as to what a temperature drop could be at maximum output. And then we implement enthalpy control and APA does this and they've done it quite successfully and they can help you with that. Um, but yeah, the temperature drop is what we have to account for. But that's the same temperature drop that actually helps us during an economizer day. So in a relatively dry 57 degree economizer day, typically you turn on the chiller. In this case, because you have an evaporative section, instead of turning on the chiller first, uh, BMS looks at your enthalpy, says, yep, we're still comfortable. We could take some more humidity and still feel comfortable inside a building. Instead of turning the chiller on, we start the humidifier. And, and because of that drop in or depression in temperature, we can spray two, three, four percent of water, not gain a lot of humidity, but gain your temperature that you're looking for without turning on the chiller. So typically, again, you're gonna extend that economizer day to offset your wintertime heat, 20 to 40 days. And that that's, a lot more energy running a chiller, think about this. Uh, the, the hybrid, which is a little bit more, I wouldn't call it more energy use because it's really not much. It's like running a 60 watt light bulb and a toaster oven. That would be the DL versus a chiller. And also don't forget when you uh, have, you know, that, that good humidity range, you don't have as much uh, evaporation of moisture from your skin and so you don't feel as cold so you can actually turn down your sensible heat or your thermostat by two degrees and be as comfortable as you are with a higher temperature so that's a sort of another energy offset and um as for the heating add-on for the adiabatic evaporators that's also in that same calculator tool so it's considered as well um, you know, we try and grab as much information from the building as possible. And uh, if we don't get everything exactly the way it is, we work with a couple of assumptions in there to uh, just try and get the best picture of that. Um, Mark asks, given that RH is related to temperature, if we lower temperature to increase humidity, does it have the same effect as having, let's say, 72 Fahrenheit and 40% if it was 68 Fahrenheit and 40%? Same benefit. Yeah. So, Mark, from that first study that Stephanie looked at, uh, it looked at a bunch of different parameters, and absolute humidity was one, and relative humidity was one. And the one that correlated with the data the best was really the relative humidity and not so much the absolute humidity. So, the benefit of humidification will be the same dependent on the relative humidity. And that's something engineers seem to prefer to talk about absolute humidity or dew point design, but it really is the temperature related relative humidity that uh, affects our health. Yeah. Um, with that, we've gone through the questions. Uh, I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today. Um, remember, there are the handouts right now, so all the slides that are available are there. Um, as well as the Condair product handbook. Um, uh, thanks, Stephanie and Tom, for joining and giving this presentation. And there will be a follow-up email to this 
uh, it'll include a certificate um, for all attendees that you can use to apply for your professional development hours. And uh, thanks for joining us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.